Colleen because she's here in town right now having opened a project last night at Fort Mason um, with the great hosting of Frank Schmigel and his team there. I'm a guest curator um, who was able to convince him to work with me and Colleen. That's Frank laughing. <laughs> Her. She has a long and varied career, as many of you might know, um, that has veered and evolved over time. So uh, Colleen has some Bay Area roots. She went to SF State, uh, undergrad film, um, and also then went to UCLA for her master's in film. And she currently teaches there as a fine arts professor, right? Not just a film professor, I believe. Um, she herself, um, made a really wonderful feature film, the only one of her life, in the 90s in Oakland, which has recently been re-released, Dry Long So, and has been touring around the country. I think it's playing tomorrow in Portland. <laughs> and uh, with that, she's been able to be um, the, sorry, it is very gender beautiful, the keynote speaker at a lot of different places, including the Black Star Film Festival, um, Sorry, it's so dark up here. <laughs> and um, other important screenings, uh, but Black Star is the most important one, right? Um, so she began in her career after that one feature film um, in uh, making a series of short films primarily, um, shown outside of gall gallery context. And with that and her work after that, um, there's always a kind of continuity around gathering and around future possibilities, future histories that can come through the collective effort of lots of different people. And she incorporates elements of science fiction, Afrofuturism, DIY creativity, popular music, collective liberation, 20th century experimental film, and uh, her own evolving visual lexicon, some of which you'll see um, has appeared in the project at Fort Mason uh, that is actually on flags, not on film or in a gallery. Um, she started to do more multimedia installations, I think, as a means to situate her films in galleries. And so now she's become quite well known for these beautiful environments that employ light, um, colored lights, objects, um, films, and really have um, an incredible sense of life in them. Um, and she also sometimes stages those outside of the context of her films at this point now. She's also really interested in performance and group action and has had uh, processions, pop-up marching bands on street corners in Chicago, proper parades, and those also kind of inform her film work um, and the ways in which she creates scenarios for the film work. This use of text-based banners that's in the film work and in these parades and regalia is um, quite a common feature in her work and was why I originally invited her to do something at Fort Mason. She really loves these things, even though they're related to complicated things like the military, Catholicism, Masons, all these things, but they're also related to protest and communal gathering and all these other things that are beautiful ways of people coming together. But she really looks at them for the ways in which banners and other non-visual, or sorry, non-verbal forms of communication are able to convey so much, oftentimes, that words cannot. And that's really at the heart of her project at Fort Mason, which I know she will show some images up here. Um, she's had so many solo exhibitions at this point, I can't really list them all. Um, and in the past five years, she has had exhibitions just at the Whitney Museum, SF MoMA, Mass MoCA, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the ICA Philadelphia, which was a show that traveled around. Um, she's been awarded the 2022 Heinz Award of the Arts, a 2021 Guggenheim, and um, she is currently in an exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum called Musical thinking, new video art, and sonic strategies. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's so tacky. What? I'm crying. I'm just seeing it. I, oh. I, rough, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. It's, tacky. it's okay. It's classy. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, she will be next exhibiting in Aspen. 
Um, she will also have a kind of mini retrospective several nights of programming at the PFA in February. So you can find um, her work there too. Uh, Colleen, come on down. Hi everyone, I really do apologize for this slide. I do, I always um, make a new talk, but I always cannibalize old talks and I was really sloppy today, so I apologize. I'm really happy to be here and I want to thank Liz Thomas and Frank Schmigel for bringing me to San Francisco to Fort Mason to do this project that started before COVID and Frank managed to like keep the Kindle going and Liz very persistently encouraged me to keep um, thinking about, it's just like whatever I'm interested in, whatever I want to do, let's try. And we did try. So I'm going to talk about that, but I'm going to, um, oh wait, okay. I'm going to um, start the, the talk with a film. Um, and then I'm going to be talking really fast because I have too many slides. So, because I'd rather just do Q&A with you, so you can just sort of like ask me to revisit something that I'm moving over too quickly. Um, so I'm just going to start with this film, which is a bit of an origin story. Oh, I'm getting a spinning wheel, sorry. <laughs>
So um, that film was made in 2010, and it was um, at the beginning of my kind of uh, dealing with or wondering about um, militaristic operations and the way they get sort of pushed into other kinds of spaces and they kind of leave the threat or promise of violence behind and offer something else. I was studying in the archives of Sun Ra and uh, he had a real fascination with the military and had a real passion about talking about discipline as opposed to freedom. Um, and this tension between discipline and freedom is something that's fascinated me fascinating ever since I encountered his ideas on that, where he basically said that in the quest for liberation, black people always talk about freedom, but what he felt we should be thinking about is uh, discipline, and that we would get much further with that. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. He was, he was curmudgeonly. <laughs> um, but I love, conceptually, I love this dialectic between freedom and discipline that he was proposing. The picture that you're looking at right now, um, Oh, so anyway, so I collaborated with a Southside Chicago marching band. I found one that was willing to play Sun Ra music and do flash mobs instead of parades. And, um, and then we chose sites based on where they wanted to play, where they had never played, and also that were of tangential interest in Sun Ra's creative practice. So Chinatown Square in, in um, Chicago was a very sort of like charged site in all of those regards. So this slide is about, um, this is the overhead view of the Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. I was just there last week, and I'm still thinking about some of the things I learned when I went on this tour of the cemetery. Um, uh, we uh, got to watch the uh, ritual that is um, performed repeatedly all day from sunrise to sunset at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. There is a very special cadre of soldiers who are trained to perform um, this ceremony, is what they call it, that honors the soldiers and uh, different um, civilians or their families or veterans also participate. It is a really, um, if you've ever seen it, maybe you were bored, but I thought I was gonna be bored, but instead what happened was that I was completely, devastatingly transfixed by the rigor of what it means to make the ritual. I thought that I would have all kinds of opinions about the military, et cetera, et cetera, that I would be holding while I was watching it. But instead, the ritual did what it was supposed to do, which was override my opinions and instead perform for me the importance and sacredness of their purpose. And I thought, huh, there's something in that that seems like sometimes what happens in performance or art that's really important to think about. And the thing that kind of blew me away about the ritual was the level of discipline that it required to perform it. The movements are very slow. You see that really weird angle that they have to cock their foot? A lot of things about it really intrigued me in terms of their difficulty and precision, which is very difficult, the uh, opposite of kind of like how I like to work, which is in an improvisational mode, which is what I'm gonna talk about. I also want to talk about the fact that there is a sort of historical origin story that I learned about there that I'll then kind of like the repercussions and echoes of it landed me right here in Fort Mason with a project that we just opened. Um, this is the cemetery. That house up on the hill is the hill, um, the, the mansion, plantation of General Lee, who was the general for the Confederacy. Um, Lincoln begged him to be the general for the Union because he was a great general, apparently. He refused. Um, he, was, he and his wife um, were the holders of this particular land, was a plantation, was slaves. Um, when he went to, um, when he became a traitor and fought for the Confederacy, the Union confiscated his plantation and they turned it into a cemetery as a form of retribution on Lee. Um, so the Arlington National Cemetery, which I never knew, is actually um, on the site of a very large operation, operating plantation. This will matter, this will matter. This is a site of like a, a, the beginning of the commemorating of a freedom's town, a freedman's town. Newly emancipated slaves built a village on this um, site as well. Um, um, they built building structures. They were there for 37 years after the war. Um, and then the US government confiscated it to expand the cemetery. 
Um, there is a new, uh, newly empowered um, site on the cemetery, which you see on the, uh, um, is um, here in this picture are the quote-unquote slave cabins. Um, the, the upper right, or upper left corner is what they looked like before they were restored. And before they were restored, they were used as a gift shop and a bathroom, and no one was told that they were slave cabins. Because no one is, until 2019 was ever even told that the cemetery is on a plantation. It's not part of the narrative that's offered. Um, they've been restored to that pretty yellow, um, decorated structure. This woman um, on the right-hand side of this picture, Selena Gray, pictured with her two daughters in the stereoscopic picture that was really recently acquired by the Park Service. Um, she was a resident of that structure. She was the first um, the handmaiden to Lee's wife. This is the newly restored um, image of the inside of the slave cabin and now that the park has restored it and has decided to tell the story of the slaves' importance to the story. And they're, um, okay. It looks like a near loft, but aside from that, um, um, uh, the, the, the Selena Gray and her husband had eight children and they all lived in this structure together. And here they have picture three. And this is only part of the cabin. This is a, an adjacent room where they play a video that's about the descendants of Selena Gray. This is more like what maybe it would have looked like. Um, this is a, a wider picture of the room. You see there on the right, you can barely make out there's a little kitten sleeping on the bed for two in a room that was for 10 people. So I, when I entered the room, I had this weird kind of cognitive estrangement where I was like, wait, though. I'm, I'm so excited that this history is being told, but it is not in alignment with what I'm seeing. And that kitten in particular kind of sent me into a fugue where I, I couldn't even take pictures. This picture is, I found this on someone's blog on a website, because I couldn't even take a picture of the kitten on the bed. Um, and as an art teacher, I've become accustomed to the way that artists are very sus suspicious of embellishments in artwork, you know? Um, whether it's in the swelling music in a movie, or seeming flourishes on a painting, a common criticism of an artwork might be that the artist has decorated or embellished it. And this is implicitly understood to be a slur. And this is a harsh thing to say to an artist, and it means that you are hiding something or you are failing to be clear and honest. Um, decoration and embellishment in contemporary art are considered crutches unless they become the actual subject of the work. And um, they're crutches that are used in an act of dissembling. Um, and implicit in this embellishment is an understanding that one is hiding something, something that is possibly ugly or a failure. Um, oops. And um, so, you know, we're at the heart of the, oops, sorry, I can't get the slide to move. I can't, okay. At the heart of the, the nation's democracy, and they have this little stuffed kitten sleeping on the bed. And um, to me, that's an embellishment. And to me, that's about dissembling. And it's about a refusal to actually acknowledge what actually occurred. Um, and so that's at the heart of a lot of my work, this question about like how to talk about these things. But then I also question the act of embellishment itself because I love to do it. <laughs> so I was like, well, OK, 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 I got to dial it back and figure out and really like look at what I'm doing, when I'm doing it, how I'm doing it. Am I lying or am I hoping? Sometimes when I'm embellishing and putting sparklers, sparkles and things on things, I'm, it's a wish, it's a wish for something better. But in, in, that, in so doing, am I possibly dissembling? So it's something I'm thinking about, which is why I'm talking to you about it. What you're seeing now are, um, it's like pictures, some of them sent to me by Liz, thank you Liz, of um, the flags that are now installed at Fort Mason. Um, I wonder if this is a video. I'm putting a little bit. Yeah. Um, um, you have to look up to see them. They were designed um, this year after many years of visiting Fort Mason and having conversations with Frank and Liz. And finally, we got to sit down in person at Fort Mason and look through some archives and stumble on these pictures of what the place looked like when it was in service to the military during World War II. Um, and this got my juices flowing because y'all know I like regalia so much. 
I'm very shallow. Like, I totally love the way marching bands look, and I don't care that that is from the military. I do care. I'm interested in that. But, but I really, I take profound pleasure in, like, the crispness of the aesthetic and the way in which that crispness announces a coming. That was designed to tell you that you were going to die. Like, marching bands were actually... <laughs> Like the first thing you heard before you even saw the army coming to plunder you. Um, and that's the reality of the origins of marching bands. But they actually come from West Africa, and they're all actually, their true origins are in masquerades, which are actually about honoring ancestors, but that's another lecture. Um, this is about the military and its aesthetic powers. Um, but a lot of the pictures that they were showing me were like this and like this. And like this gorgeous, almost Gordon Parks-like composition, and like this. And by the time, like at halfway there, I was like, why is everybody black, Frank? And Frank was like, I don't really know. Let's, and so we started to try and find out. And what I learned was that um, you know these buildings, which were this quartermaster stations that the, the, what is it called? The gateway to the Pacific, where you loaded up all the soldiers and all the supplies and everything they needed to go do war. Um, quartermasters are uh, largely, it's a racially assigned um, task in the military. It's something that black soldiers did. They didn't see the theater of battle. Their task was to deal with provision, service, and logistics. This goes all the way back to the Civil War, which is why I was talking to you about Arlington. It goes back to that. When newly emancipated slaves followed around Union um, soldiers and worked in service of them, uh, officers would, uh, it, it was called impressing, this is a fascinating word, would impress slaves back into quote unquote service for them during um, their military operations. And they did all of the sort of like heavy lifting of creating barriers, the, the um, operational logistics of battle. And they, they died on the, on the troops too. Um, in that research, I found this flag. And this flag, I thought, um, this way of signifying what quartermasters do in all the wars since the Civil War, I thought it was gorgeous. Handmade, made of wool and cotton. Um, and, um, and, and we just decided, yeah, what, what the buildings at Fort Mason need is to return to their origins, their history, and also to talk about the actual history, the documented history of who <coughs> actually activated those buildings and how that was done and even how that was decided. So I started making these flags, um, designing these flags with that in mind, but with a, a particular kind of, um, Mm. Nice word would be like resentment at the way in which the military racially enclosed individuals into a particular kind of job, but then also a, a, a kind of um, profound respect at the individuals who did those jobs well, and um, what it what it means to to understand as you're doing a job that you are operating within a racial enclosure and to still do that with great dignity which is what African Americans in this country have done for several hundred years. Um, so we made these flags, I'm just showing you views of them. This was like my favorite. Rasta, like kicking it, composing a song with this flag, this wagging tongue flag. Here's another one. So um, there's something about the the sort of like reactivation of that building that in my mind has a kind of ritualistic. I wasn't I didn't I wasn't here when they install reinstalled the flagpoles and raised the flags and in retrospect I'm like wow we should have done a ritual around it because something has occurred with the return of these flags and also these particular flags being a way in which the history of who did that work, who the quartermasters were can't be dismissed or erased, I hope, again. And, I, and I'm, I'm hopeful that you know, Fort Mason as a park is um, actively embracing this history and now I feel like they're really sort of like 
producing an environment in which a discourse can occur, which I'm really grateful for. So this is the definition of ritual. After watching those soldiers do the, the heel click and all that, I was like, what are they doing? That really messed with me. Like, it messed with me. They undermined my own convictions in the power of the ritual. How do they do that? And I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I want to be able to make something that destabilizes someone and what they think they know so that something else is possible within them. That's what I think art is for. This is a really, I think, Miriam Webster great definition of what a ritual is. On the flip side, though, I'm very dependent upon improvisation, and as an ethic, it's something that I believe in. Ironically, Miriam Webster Dictionary does not know what improvisation is. <laughs> they don't know. I know, though. Let me tell you. I'll tell you. So, when I'm thinking about Improvisation. I'm thinking of it in terms of like the deep cult, um, black cultural practice of, of what we call jazz or creative music in this country. And what that means is that uh, a group of um, highly skilled uh, musicians agree to operate within a certain framework of progression of chords. But then they also agree that at any moment, any one of the participants in that could leave that progression and go elsewhere, and then they all decide whether or not they will go with them, support them, or contradict them, or try and pull them back with, with, with their own sort of like contribution to the musical conversation. Improvisation isn't possible without a very high level of, of I'm not using the word mastery anymore, I'm using the phrase, what is the phrase I came up with? High level of accomplishment. Trying to find a non-gendered word to talk about when you're at your A-game. So improvisation requires A-game abilities. Um, um, and and in, 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 in that complete understanding of what you and your instrument can do, you can do anything at any time, at any moment, with anyone. That is what improvisation is at its best. But it also requires a kind of agreement and it also requires an agreement that that agreement may be broken. And that is radical because that is a refusal of order. And, but it is also a commitment and an interest in collaboration and conversation at the same time. And to me, that's really interesting. That's like a kind of human experiment of how to be social and how to be together that we haven't really uh, fully explored except in black music. So these are um, these really fresh, hot off the presses photos of the flags before they got on the poles. This is the closest that I've gotten to them. And um, I wanted to talk to you about the titles and talk to you about the quartermasters. So this is called Shiny Things for My Quartermasters. And um, a lot of the quartermaster insignia, you can see it on the buildings in the picture I showed you. There's always an eagle and it's holding a key and it's holding a sword. Um, but I replaced the eagle with a crow. For me, the crow pops up in a lot of my work, if not all of it now at this point. Um, and to me, the crow and the, um, the black figure are interchangeable signifiers of a kind of being that has um, been placed in, in, um, in, into a hierarchy at its bottom rung and is the receptacle of all dread, fear, distaste, disdain, resentment and horror. So it doesn't matter what a crow does, when people see them, they think it's bad. And, and you know, that's pretty much what it's like to walk around being black in America. Um, and so to me, they're like an equal signifier. Um, and then the, the key, the banner, the ribbon, I was like, love, I love these symbols in banners. I use them all the time. Um, because like, um, I use them for the same reason that these people in these corporate powers like religious organizations or military organizations use them is because of the way that they um, uh, produce a kind of fluttering hope in you when you see them and the repetition of the, of the symbol um, is almost like a trigger of a kind of submission to that hope. Shiny things from my quartermasters. You know crows like to give things to people, shiny things to people they like, right? Um, this one, yes sir, taking the swallowtail flag and um, turning it into a wagging tongue and tongue in cheek talking about um, one of the things about the military that is, um, you know, 
like less than ideal in terms of looking at it as a model for human co collaboration and um, collect collective action, which it really is, is the fact that it's coerced through the hierarchy of the order and that you have to follow an order, which is the opposite of improvisation, right? Where uh, at any moment it's understood, no matter who you are in the band, that someone could, and often does, decide that the whole operation is gonna go elsewhere. It doesn't happen in the military. You, you, you say yes, sir, and you do your orders. Um, one of the symbols in the quartermaster uh, iconography was this hand holding the guiding light, um, which I loved. Um, and it actually started to make me think about other like, nonverbal um, forms of communication that are about signaling, secretly signaling in, in plain sight, which was like some of the lore around the Underground Railroad and, and fugitive um, slaves liberating themselves. And so I combined them, and this one's called They Got You Scared of the Dark. <laughs> this one's called Hanging on a Clothesline Knot, much in that same vein. There's this myth that um, um, on the Underground Railroad, people would hang up um, quilts, and it would be like a map so that you could know where to go. That is a complete, that's not true. That would be dumb, right? It's like someone would figure that out. They would like, anyway, so, but people really love this idea about the African-American quote and, and, and have doubled down on it, but it's not true. So this was just a sardonic way of talking about actually navigation happened by stars and stars only. And it was the, the dipper that was the key to liberation. This is one of the most true re, uh, reproductions of uh, the quartermaster flag only instead of red, white, and blue, I'm using red, black, and green, which are the black nationalist colors. And this was like instantiated, of course, by David Hammonds with his flag decades ago, which I'm just reiterating. Um, one of my favorites, this one is called um, The Limits of Hospitality, which is really thinking about this um, assignment of characteristics to a people based on race. And yeah. These are the uh, drawings that I'm sharing, and this is what I showed Frank and Liz early on. And I was like, look, well, okay, I'm ready. And they're like, uh huh. Um, and, um, but it's like very much how I work like this tension between like the, the loose and then something um, like this that is tight, tight, tight and, and endlessly reproducible to like, but it always begins with something like this, which is almost like just a, 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 a flurry that then I just work over and over again into something coherent. And this idea of like the heraldry, the flag, the signal, this very formal, and what I would actually call corporate signifier. Because, I, I mean, I, look, forgive me, but I think of the Catholic Church as a corporation, right? They hold a lot of property, they got a lot of political power, and they've been doing this for a long time. Early adopters of slavery, uh, Africa and this weird chopped up map can thank the Catholic Church for that map, because uh, they were in there before anybody, um, and, and, and with great profit. Um, and so um, I love their heraldry because it very clearly expresses that power. Um, but then it does something where that power invites you in and seduces you and, and gives you a sense of, of um, well, the, the order gives you a sense of kind of calm, like a sense of place, like you're in the right place. So I use these banners because that's how they work on people. That's how advertising works on people. And I use them often to invite people into rooms where there is total chaos. Like I would call this a noisy room. This piece is called Epistrophe. It's part of a show called Give It or Leave It, which is what that is. Um, and um, this is, I would, I, there's no other way to describe this room or this piece as loud, even though the sound is like soft winds, bird calls, ambient. And what's happening here is it's a tabletop where objects are um, scattered and then there are CCTV cameras producing these activated uh, projections elsewhere. Um, and I don't know any, um, I think there's like a tension between like what happens if you focus on the table and what happens if you notice that what you're seeing on the table is being projected. And I like to combine this combination of like this sort of like order and power with a kind of total chaos of that room and then a kind of empty space that is really about where 
the spectator can be. So the empty space is not really empty because it's an anticipation and an invitation to people to be in this chaos, this um, assertion of order, um, and all the noise, and to have time and space, their own space, to decipher it. So the bombastic moments, like the room before, move into calm and emptiness and darkness like this. I really play a lot with light, and I think of light, um, you know, like in art spaces, it's, um, it's a light isn't really considered. You just need light so you can see the painting on the wall, right? So if you come in with a video or something and you need a black box and it's a white room with some very general floodlights, you are like, mm. We don't do that. We have to repaint it white. It just costs a lot of money, no. I'm like, but I'm ah, ah. <laughs> Would you say that to a painter? Like, let's say it was a black box space, and the painter's like, I need a white wall, and it needs a lot of light. And you're like, mm, no, we're just going to lean the painting against the wall, right? It's fine, right? People can still see it, right? That's kind of the way video is often treated in institutions, as if, like, mm, the trouble you have to go to to actually make it look right. Um, isn't really necessary. <laughs> it's like the value is not equivalent. And that's changing, but there are still often battles. So now instead of like just fighting the battles, I just use the light, I change the light, I augment the light. Instead of controlling it, I try and draw attention to it. And especially when you get to use natural light, what's wonderful is that then suddenly the entire room becomes a, a sundial. Because the longer you're in the room, the more you notice the way the colors of the lights are moving. You realize that you're on a planet that is moving around the earth. And I think that that's like a really important thing to remember. Um, so the tabletops are um, sort of like this play space that I can democratically arrange objects. Um, and um, the objects are, some are procured, they're very expensive or precious. Some are made, some are found, some are thrift shop. Uh, it could be a live plant or it could be like an antique Dogon um, statue all on the tabletop arranged to a narrative in my mind and there's enough of a combination of objects so that there's enough familiar things on the table so that anybody could make uh, their own, so sorry, is that thing going on the whole time? Make their own narrative and that um, uh, there's a familiarity and an estrangement that's happening at the same time. So if you look at the objects on the table and you see that video playing behind them which is always like a iPhone video landscape you also see in that picture that there's a CCTV camera aimed at it. And that CCTV camera sees everything on the table just like you do, but it actually doesn't see everything. It crops it, it turns it into a cinema space. And that cinema space actually deceives. So what you'll see in some other part of the room is this projection. That projection you see there on the top is a, it are the objects that were on that table there but the camera sees it completely differently. And so this is like one of my interests in cinema now is um, what it does and what it does not see. The way in which it shapes the landscape, but also completely distorts it. I'm really interested in those shifts of scale and perspective and the tension there. And um, I'm gonna show you some um, drawings that led to this most recent body of work, which is these banners that are considering this relationship to time and scale, human scale versus geological scale. And I'm trying to talk about time instead of ecology, um, because, you know, like, the planet has, like, destroyed everything on it five or six times. This situation that we're in right now, which is very painful to watch, not so much because of what's happening to humans, but all the other beings that we put in peril, it's not necessarily new. The planet's responding to conditions, and it's done it before. So I'm trying to think about this in terms of time, so that maybe if we understand our relationship to it, maybe we might have different conversations that produce different results instead of the results we're getting. These candles, this is an object made out of wax. Um, and those are wicks burning, and that is how this piece shows. Um, these are called unconformities, because in geology, when you have a situation where there's like uh, earth plateaus that are kind of slamming into each other at different angles, that's called an unconformity. 
and I can't think of a better name for any kind of object. Um, um, and these are just sort of like invitations to think about topography, striation, layers, like, you know, um, the, the geologic spike of like trying to pinpoint the point in time when one era begins and another ends. So without, I'm not actually gonna talk about the Anthropocene. I, I just said it, <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, they're like fighting over where that spike is gonna go. And as far as I'm concerned, that spike begins the moment that colonization begins about 600 years ago. But I'll let them fight over it. It doesn't matter to me where they put the spike. The problem is the problem. And the problem is what we're doing right now. So these, this body of work is about considering this problem, not from an ecological perspective, but from a human relations, human planet relations perspective. There's another candle. They're weighing about 250 pounds or four feet by two feet. The wicks burn all the way down. Here's a surface. And I use wax, like initially I was playing with ceramics, but I can't uh, get ceramics to keep moving. Once you fire something, it's done. It's, and sometimes to me, like wet clay is so exciting and beautiful and once you fire it, it kind of dies. But wax doesn't stop. You can't freeze it, you can't stop it from moving. Um, I'll, just, I'll just keep going. I'm gonna try and get just too many slides, huh? I'm sorry. I'm gonna we're gonna wrap it up. I'm just showing you the work. This show is called My Caldera, and it kind of focused around thinking about what it would mean if there was some uncontested land for people who have nowhere to go, which is kind of how I think about black people in the diaspora, particularly in the Caribbean and America, that we're very much on land and less so in the Caribbean, but in North America we're like land is not ours. And so even if there was some like liberatory, like fantasy land where anti-blackness were to cease in America, um, we still wouldn't have like an actual place. Um, and I was thinking, oh, volcanoes are cool though because they're constantly generating new land. Um, and so I was using the volcano as a sort of proposal of violent destruction that then produces this very generative new space for those of us who need it. And so the banners are a kind of hearkening, hearkening of um, what what could be coming, um, and also a, a real affectionate gesture towards sort of like um, poetic gestures in Black popular culture or other thinkers. Like this is a this is a this is I'm quoting Fred Moten in this banner, but Fred Moten I believe is quoting someone else. I just am not clever enough to figure out who. I who am not one, but there's another um, phrase, I who, am, who have nothing, that is a Sylvester song. I don't know if you know who Sylvester is, but San Francisco legend, um, house uh, singer, and it's one of my favorite songs by him. And so these, there's another banner that says I who have nothing, and they're talking about the relationship of individualism and um, communalism and, and how we move in and out of them. Also suggesting, like, which is what the volcano always suggests all day, every day, is that the world already ended. And so we're just living in the aftermath. Some of us more so than others, I suppose. This is a little chapbook I wrote called the Volcano Manifesto, which is sort of like, really just sort of me organizing the thinkers that are helping me think and then talking back to them. People like Fred Moten, Lisan, Christina Sharp, uh, Cynthia Hartman, uh, Zakia Jackson, um, Derrida, <laughs> um, well, who else is in there? Just anyway, it's pretty random. Um, so a few pop stars. Um, this is an installation view of how the banners function as a procession through the space. Am I going too fast? No, 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 we're good. Okay. Um, I, um, again, you'll see in this how I'm trying to like control the light, like, like I say, galleries don't really often have ways to control light. So instead of fussing about that, I, I just use the skylights as um, um, a ways to dim the space, but also to create these pockets of light that would make you more aware of the light. And I'm gonna close this talk by um, showing you the film. That's part of this body of work, it's called My Caldera. That's it in its installation form.
and it's a love letter to uh, volcanoes and the end of the world, I suppose.
Thanks. production process that you go through to make a film and just may land in a different medium but the thinking process is the same just because it was how I was trained this is how you make something you know what I mean um, and the, that how I arrived at doing installations or even just making objects was that I would often make a lot of objects for my films um, and then I like a lot of, of artist friends were like so is that a sculpture or is that a prop and I was like, I mean, what? It's a, I'm using it in the film. It's a prop. And they're like, but is it a sculpture or is it a prop? Uh, and so I was like getting the hint that maybe they were suggesting that there was already something happening there. And then also sometimes, honestly, because filmmaking is so depleting and to me actually um, just a way to gather material, the, the process it, itself is something I'm working on making less torturous. Um, sometimes I um, make the things I need for the film, like banners or an object, and then I just don't feel like making the film, and I feel like those things are doing something. But lately it feels like I need film with the objects, and I'm really interested in the triangulation. Hi. Um, I was interested in your talk, you had this cringiness about the word ecologies, and wanted to shift into time, and I can assume things about that shift, but I want to, I'd like to hear more, so I'm not just assuming things. Yeah, I just, I, it's hard because I, I don't want to have opinions about it. I want to talk about the work, and I'm not sure, if the work isn't doing it, then it's not doing it yet, you know what I mean? But I think, like, uh, just on a baseline, when I hear people talking about saving the planet, I just know that we are doomed because it's a profound misunderstanding of our relationship to this object in space that keeps us alive. And that fundamental, and as long as we're talking in that ecological discourse, we are just gonna keep dying. That's it. And so I just, I like need to stay out of that language somehow and make things that stay outside of that language because that language is about a, this sort of dominion hierarchy that we fantasize ourselves in. Where we, the humans, save everything, or care for anything, care for anything, or decide what lives and dies, and that's what's killing us. That hierarchy, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just have to share that I, sh I just tonight showed my students uh, Herzog's uh, Grizzly Man, oh, yeah. and that kind of speaks exactly to uh, that guy, Timothy Treadwell, who, who's like, I'm protecting the bears. <laughs> um, it made no sense. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and in that, um, and, and revisiting that tonight, I kept thinking about this idea of like forever. Like he kept telling the animals, I'll love you forever. And I don't know, your, your, your work is really interesting to me in terms of this sense of like, whoa, what? What is the, and I don't know how to, uh, you know, uh, I sort of just raised my hand to say, to add to that, there's so many conversations, um, so many uh, things that spark from, from your work, I really appreciate it, and I, and I have to say, I don't know if you recognize it from the state or from interviewing you, but I've been a fan since uh, I do recognize you, I was trying to figure it out. Of a lot of spirit, <laughs> Chandra. Okay, 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 yeah. hi. I'm sorry. So, um, so since we were both studying film uh, there, I have to ask, I love the Caldera film, is it, do I have to go to a gallery? 
to see it? Can I show it to Yeah, this one this one know? this one can be theatrical. It can play with other films okay. and other things. Sometimes I'm very fussy about that. There's some films that I quite love, but they I don't play them in film festivals, but this isn't one of them. So it's I think it played maybe a couple of weeks ago at Cinematheque or, or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's fantastic. Thank you. Oh, there's a hand. Uh, I, I also thought that the color of them was so amazing. And just wonder if you, if you um, feel like seeing anything, seeing anything more about how you made it. Oh, sure. Or, and, you know what you're thinking about. I mean, I can I can see what you're thinking about it a lot, but um, maybe more about how it, how you made it. You yeah, know? I meant to tell you that anyway. So thanks for asking. Um, it's um. Uh, TikTok videos of mostly the Icelandic volcano that popped off during COVID. And I think I'm one of like maybe 20,000 artists that became obsessed with this volcano and started making work about it to the point now where this is the last body of work that I'll make about volcanoes because so many artists are really doing it. I don't even have to. It's just like I go to their show, I'm like, yep, that, that's, that's what I would have done. Like, you know what I mean? so, but this was the beginning of that work. And, um, and it's um, like, so they're TikTok videos that I download, and then they're um, printed frame by frame onto celluloid, 35 millimeter celluloid, with my HP laser printer, which is what produces that dot matrix textile looking pattern on the ink. And then uh, re uh, spliced together, and then digitized, and then re edited. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes. Um, you spoke a lot about, like, in the beginning of your talk about um, like this notion of like improv as improv and also like in relationship to like cinema and jazz music um, and I'm so curious to hear more about like the music that you're including in, in your video pieces mm -hmm. and your film um, and just kind of like how you're thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say probably all of my work even if there's no music in the work is music driven as well as film driven or it's like it's like a love of, of music and a, suspi a suspicion or a hatred of film combined in all the films. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where I'm trying to break Monster. cinema, but then love sound. And, and so um, uh, that last piece was just some um, young people that I know in LA who are budding musicians, uh, or teenagers, and a duo, like guitar uh, drum duo. And I was like, you think you can make me some metal? <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm really like wanting some bad brains, like, 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 so, like, and they're like, yes. So that's how that came about. And I love those kind of collaborations. But like for me, like greatest joy is collaborating with musicians. Like I can't get enough of it. Yeah. Yes, Liz. This is a very specific question, but since I had never seen Michael Dare before, um, the songs for Earth and Folk. Oh yeah, yeah. Which is the piece I showed in an exhibition about time because my caldera wasn't made yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious, like if you, I mean, if there's an obvious relationship between the two in my head in terms of like, and that piece is kind of an entreaty for us to like have a different relationship to Earth. Um, but I'm just curious if you could like talk about the two because that one is like gentle and. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still pretty. Yeah, it's not gentle. Sorry, but it's more about like uh, it, not not acknowledging the world has already ended. Maybe. Yeah. So the film she's talking about is a found footage film that was commissioned by Chicago Film Archive. They have this amazing archive of just like home movies or industrial films that they'll just collect anything from the region. And then every summer they commission three filmmakers and three musicians or bands to collaborate and make a film. So, um, and, and the archive is too big to look at everything, so you have to work with an archivist and give them a list of what you're interested in. I was like, astronauts, black people, bicycles, flowers, <laughs> Africa, like literally that broad, like literally. And then, uh, then they give me that footage and I'm like, okay. So then you, then you make something, I'd never made a found footage film for good reason, it's difficult. And um, and then it was paired with this amazing band called The Eternals. Of Damon Locks is an amazing musician right now, on fire right now, as, uh, as part of. Anyway, so that film is like basically a blues song. That's a conversation between humans who are called folk and Earth, who's trying to tell the humans like, please chill out because I'm I'm really over you. It's a blues song, 
where like the planet is literally saying like I have tried to work with you and now I'm done and like humans that get expelled they have to go into space and they, they think that they've won and then they just wither and die and Earth is like yo told you <laughs> so that's, what, that's what that film is and, um, and, and, and this film is also found footage, so um, yeah, I didn't even think about that. These are the only two found footage films I've ever yeah. made, and they're both just pure music yeah. soundtracks. Uh, there's a hand right there. Um, you were saying that you, you made like a sh shift from like starting to see your props as like sculptures. Like, yeah, I did say that. I'm not sure that I, I'm still, I'm not sure but, I would say I make sculptures. Yeah, my, my question was, is like, do you think that anything is lost when you read a prop as a sculpture? Like, is something, is there something beneficial to reading a sculpture as a prop? Uh, I like the idea of reading sculptures as props, mm -hmm. because that means that you're going to do something with them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what happens when a prop gets sort of like turned into this rarefied object where it, it doesn't have to perform its role in the whatever narrative or scenario it was designed for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to talk your time, but um, I'm really interested in the, the flags remind me of um, uh, Haitian flags, mm -hmm. and um, and there seems to be like this sort of play. I don't think you use this language, but like sacred and profane um, and um, I wondered if you know you could talk a little bit about that you talked about Catholicism as a corporation mm -hmm. and, and you know kind of Catholicism capitalism but are you interested in I mean it seems it seems like there's a thread do you think about the sacred versus the profane or that they're that they overlap um, if it's I think I think what you're talking about is how I freely appropriate religious signifiers and objects and tools. And um, I mean, I, I really try not, I try not to talk about things like religion as religious practices or spiritual practices. It's a common question, like, what is your spirit? And I'm, and I'm actually not trying to do that because I'm actually trying to talk about art. Um, and I, I don't want to suggest to people who have really deep spiritual practices that that's the same as art or vice versa. So I kind of church and state them, keep them separate. Um, uh, but the reason that I use these tools and tropes of religious organization is because there aren't that many very, very large organizational bodies where you get people to agree like, and to like move as one. And religion and the military are two organizations that can do that. Um, and, um, and both are really profoundly fraught with problems in that enterprise, but I'm really interested in the systems they have used to make it possible. I'm interested in those systems. I don't know if like their visual languages are as, as flawed as their actual operations. Maybe they are, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I really like the regalia and the, the visual language, and I like how it works on me, even if I hate what it says. You know what I mean? So I'm interested in that. How is it doing that? And like, how, can you use that? Can you deploy that differently? You know? Thank you so much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming out.